Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jonah Albert and I am one of the cultural events producers at the library. Today we are extremely happy to have one of the best known figures in children's literature, poet, writer and broadcaster Michael Rosen talking with Chris Riddell, illustrator, author, cartoonist and also another well-known figure in children's literature. We are going, they are going to talk about Michael's new book, Many Different Kinds of Love, which contain illustrations by Chris. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions for Michael during the event, you can submit them using the question box below. A selection of questions will be answered later during the event. Use the above menu to provide us with feedback on the event and also to donate to the British Library. Your feedback is very important to us. It will help us to continue to plan and run our cultural events program. The British Library is a charity and your support helps us to open up a world of knowledge and inspiration for everybody. If you don't already have a copy of Michael's book, please click on the bookshop tab for an opportunity to get one. You'll find social media links below this video in case you want to continue the conversation on other platforms. You will also find out more about the event and also read short biographies of our speakers. And now I'll hand over to Chris and Michael. Thank you. Well, well, I'm absolutely delighted to, to be here. And, and uh, just in a very sort of quick pre-conversation with Michael, we were both getting rather nostalgic for actually being in a large tent with the wind blowing sort of across the Herefordshire countryside or possibly uh, across a town square in Edinburgh. And that lovely expectant sort of buzz you get um, uh, as, as, as an audience waits and settles and, and, and here we are, you know, sort of seamlessly. Um, and Michael, I want to first begin by, by sort of, you know, thanking you for, um, for being in conversation with me this evening. Uh, but more than that, I would just like to say a few words about sort of my response to, to this extraordinary book, which I saw in manuscript form. Um, and it, and it, uh, as soon as I sort of saw it, I, I relived as I think many of us um, subsequently have done um, this extraordinary year we've had. And what sort of leapt out at me from, from the book was well, two things. One was the, extraordinary sort of uh, candor and, and, and uh, the poetic form, which I think is, is really sort of conveys this, the extraordinary experiences you had, but also um, a, a chapter in the book that wasn't there. And it was the, um, uh, the diary of, of the carers, um, uh, the daily diaries. Um, that yes. wasn't actually in my manuscript. And um, and so I sort of only saw that once the book came out, I actually saw those extraordinary letters. And what I'd like to do, I think, is just begin by asking you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love the title. This was the other thing as well, in many different kinds of love. And I'd like to sort of maybe structure what we talk about um, based on kinds of love um, and your your experience of that. And, and, and to start maybe with, with uh, maybe a first sort of kind of love, you know, love of life. Um, Tell me a little bit about where you were sort of um, before all this happened, you know, sort of the things you were enjoying, your enthusiasms, the, your daily life in some senses before this extraordinary occurrence. Thanks for that, Chris. Yes. Um, well, it's, it's quite interesting in a, in a rather morbid way. Uh, I have spent a bit of time looking at the weeks before I got ill and indeed the, the, week, the two weeks that I was ill before I went into hospital. Uh, just sort of piecing together, what was I doing in February and March? What were we all doing um, with, at the time, um, apparently, at any rate, uh, if we can mention the government, um, not seeming to be too bothered that there was something on its way. They seemed almost, now in retrospect, sort of surprised. The World Health Organization was kind of shouting from the wings, saying terrible things are happening. In, first of all in China and then it got nearer to Italy and it was as if our government was saying oh well if it's in Italy it won't get here then mm. um, and I, I'm afraid in a strange sort of way I got affected by that and sort of went about my business Me so too, I can Michael. see I... myself March the 10th I was mm. in a school I was in um, a school in Burford I think 
and also, as it happens, in a BBC studio talking about, um, you know, the awful idea that was circulating that somehow other old people were a bit superfluous to needs. And there was me sitting there in a, in a BBC Radio 4 Today studio um, saying, well, actually, I want to live. And at that very moment, I could well have been infected or possibly even infecting other people. I was at the uh, Arsenal Stadium, the Emirates, um, mm. a couple of times in March. I was visiting schools. Um, so, yes, I was round and about in, in various places. Um, oh, teaching at Goldsmiths, uh, as you say, living life in the way that I did, travelling on buses yeah. and trains, something that I enjoy, making jokes about the fact, oh, I think on Twitter, I think I made some joke about the fact that I better not touch the banister, the not, what's it called, the rail by the side of the escalator. It's not called a banister, is it? <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the rail on the moving yes. rail by the side of the escalator, because otherwise I could get infected and drop down dead. Ha, 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 how funny. Uh, there's a kind of morbid sort of uh, frame of mind that I was in, little knowing that I was about to cop it. I remember that. I remember that, Michael, exactly that time. You've brought it vividly back to me, because as children's... Uh, people who working who work in children's literature, we we were in schools, weren't we? Because it was World Book Day. Uh, that week was a, a week of sort of book based events in schools. So we were all invited, weren't we, to go to lots and lots of different schools. And I remember that extraordinary sort of slightly jocular sort of atmosphere when we were told that shaking hands wasn't a good idea. So we used to sort of bump our sort of elbows together um yes though, about... though, though you should say in fact on march the third i think it was if i remember rightly uh, our good prime minister was uh, saying that he was shaking hands with everybody i mean Wasn't he changed he? his tune a few days later but he said shaking hands even with coronavirus patients he said that's how safe and fun it all was so on march the third he was as it were you know suggesting that Either it was perfectly safe or, and accuse me of being a conspiracy theorist, if you like, but that uh, another plan was afoot, that somehow or other the virus could spread amongst the population. A few oldies like me would cop it, but were a bit superfluous, as, as I said, um, and the population would be saved. So this lovely thing they call herd immunity without vaccination. So whether he was um, giving us that message or not, but suggesting that we all go out and shake hands with people, uh, with COVID, uh, um, seemed to be his message on March the 3rd. Interesting, Michael, isn't it? Uh, you know, that was a period when I suppose the, and I hesitate to say this, but but, but Boris Johnson's skill set, uh, such that it is, um, was rather cruelly exposed. Because I think, you know, as the seriousness of, of the situation started to sort of, you know, uh, hit us all, uh, there was a sense in which I found huge comfort in, in the, uh, the experts the so-called experts, uh, that I call them experts, um, who were telling us, you know, um, things that weren't easy to uh, uh, sugarcoat. Uh, and yet I suppose, you know, sort of uh, Johnson at his podium was all about sort of uh, the sort of bulldog spirit, which is Take it inappropriate. Yes. Take it on the chin was one of his phrases, though he did modify that by saying, but we're taking measures to balance it. I'm not quite sure how you balance taking it on the chin. Either you get it on the chin or you don't. Um, but uh, there we are. So that's, yes, that's all in the, the moment leading up to when I got ill. And sure. I noticed from Twitter that I was um, tweeting about my illness. And on day 12, I said... The year's seasons roll by in a night. Sweats, freezes, sweats, freezes. Wondered whose mouth I had. I didn't remember it as made of sandpaper. Water is as good as ever. So that was on the 27th of March, which I've put as the sort of opening lines of the book. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated as, as a, a, a poet, Michael. Were, were you... What do you think, do you think, sort of in a daily sense, about uh, recording your, your feelings, your thoughts, or is this, you know, when, when does the spirit move you? Well, I wrote something today, given that you ask, um, and it is sort of relevant. So I lost a child, as you know, uh, Eddie, uh, many years ago, and I, because I, I have to ask myself every day, how am I coping with this thing that happened to me? Um, I then also asked myself, well, how did I cope with Eddie? And so I did put pen to paper or finger to keyboard um, and sort of asked myself that question. Um, how did I cope? What, what did I do? And one of the things that I thought about, and it's, it's also to do with the book, that 
our brains are quite complicated, aren't they? Because what we do is we see, hear, smell, taste, touch things, and then we put them into words in our head, and we might call that inner speech, if you like, but it's full of sensations and things, and you're somebody who then expresses that not in words, unless you're writing a story or something, unless you're writing, but when you're doing pictures, you express that stuff in your head visually. I don't do that. I can't do that. And I don't really dance and I don't make pots um, and I don't sing in opera. Um, so what I do is I, I sort of feel that I'm pulling words out of my head in order to put the stuff in some kind of order, in some kind of shape. And so I found myself thinking today that that's what I was doing with Eddie, with the memories of, of the pictures of the moment that he died and so on, and that I put those into words. And by sorting it, it somehow rather puts me at ease. I can't really describe it. But so writing this book has been in part, at any rate, a matter of putting things to ease and thinking about the pictures of me getting ill um, me just before I went into the coma. I can't put the coma into words because it's it's gone. And then putting bit by bit the stages of recovery into words because I suppose I'm baffled by it. I'm baffled by the idea that you could be a kind of nearly dead or a halfway between alive and dead and you can't find it. And then you and then you have to sort of live with that. As you see, I'm struggling for words even just to say it. So just to sort it out, it helps me to sort of lay it down on the page and lay it down in these sort of short prose poemy, free verse kind of way that doesn't interfere too much with the first flow of feeling. So that's what I do. I mean, talking about love, Michael, um, you know, I feel this palpable sense that talking to you now, of, of sort of um, huge relief because you were the person I knew personally who contracted COVID. This thing that, that haunts our imaginations, those of us who sort of haven't been lucky enough not to have come down with it. But, but you were the, someone I knew um, who had contracted this illness and you disappeared. You disappeared. I, you, I loved your, your your daily tweets. I loved your um, education column, um, which I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, in in a COVID sense. Um, but I also sort of just loved our personal connection and illustrating um, wonderful sort of poetry for young children. With you. Could I just say I, I really don't. I really don't like that. The fact that we stood on a stage together. And there was me trying to make two or 300 children laugh at my jokes. And what were you doing? You were standing behind me, drawing me, caricaturing me, and making them laugh at your pictures rather than my gags. And you want me to join into some kind of ho-ho. You know, it was one of the most outrageous pieces of upstaging that I've ever enjoyed. No, didn't enjoy um, look, it's, it's about to happen again. It's, you see? It's, I, I think that's a little unfair, M Michael. I think I, I seem to remember um, you, you were sort of uh, talking to some, some children doing this wonderful, wonderful impromptu poem that involved um, sort of jazz hands and you were being very expressive. Uh, sort of show it, you know, doing these wonderful sort of jazz hand things, and I was able to sort of sit behind you, draw, drawing, and as you're right, and you're right, completely sort of attempting to upstage you, and I should have known better because you turned my drawing of your jazz hands into a lovely, lovely impromptu sort of poem where you mentioned your jazz ears and your jazz eyes as well so you turned it into a whole performance um so i learned my lesson that way um so i'm not going to attempt that now obviously um <laughs> very good yes yes glad to see yes that's right that's um yes it's it's almost like a demon that's kind of visited us that we're sitting here talking nicely and suddenly there's this um dibuk in jewish mythology has kind of appeared Yes. Um, in the room. Yes, lovely. I like it. Sort of disembodied Dibbuk has just appeared between. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Love it. Mm. But there's that sense, Michael, that you, that you uh, this book has, has sort of, for so many of us, um, has uh, taken us on a journey we haven't, we fortunately haven't been on. 
Um, and and it's that sort of insight, I think, that, that I found and many people are, are finding profoundly moving um, uh, about the book. It will be for many of us a record of this extraordinary time. Um, and coming back to this, this notion of love, um, I was very struck by um, the elements in, in the book from, from your, uh, your wife, Emma. Yes. And uh, then watching the extraordinary documentary that was made by Kevin MacDonald, um, where your, uh, your doctor sort of described Emma coming into the hospital and having a, a, a sort of being able to see you. Um, and they, they constructed the, an extraordinary sort of um, area almost out in the lobby you were wheeled out to see. And that was a real turning point. You, you seem to sort of come back from this liminal place that, that uh, you describe in the book. Um, uh, that's right. Tell me a bit about that. Yes. Well, Emma was uh, trying to talk to me via the phone before I went under. So she was saying things like... Um, uh, doctor told me you're all stable again and that you look better today, that you've been in a different position on your tummy, which is helping, and you've been having something to eat. This all sounds V-like progress to me, and I want you to be encouraged and feel reassured that although it may feel V-slow going and V-hard work, you are going in the right direction. Melon, fruit, cocktail, and tango on its way tomorrow. Lots of love. E, kiss, 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 kiss. And then the next day she said... Uh, you know the shit has hit the fan when the Queen is making a speech and it's not even Christmas. Kiss, 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 kiss. And then uh, straight after that, in fact, I got much worse. And uh, this is what happened. The doctor is standing by my bed asking me if I would sign a piece of paper which would allow them to put me to sleep and pump air into my lungs. Will I wake up? There's a 50-50 chance. If I say no, I say zero. And I sign. And I can remember that very clearly, that conversation. Um, because remember, I, I, I remember feeling that actually 50-50 was, was actually quite good because I was so short of oxygen, you're quite lightheaded. And so I remember thinking 50-50, blimey, that's not so bad. Uh, zero doesn't sound very good at all. So that, that's why I kind of signed. Um, and so that's when I went under. And then, as you say, we'll go back to the coma time in a minute, but um, doctors get worried. They put you under in this coma, under this coma. What are you in it or under it or both? Anyway, they put you in a coma and then they get worried whether they can wake you up. And um, by all accounts, I was sort of shaking about and waving my arms about, getting agitated. And as they saw it and reported it to Emma that I was delirious. And this is quite common in people who've been in induced coma. And then the worry, as I say, getting woken up. Um, and I think the doctor said on that documentary you mentioned that they were getting worried that I was brain dead. Um, so, so, that's the first time I'd heard that. I was watching the film, and then when he said it, I went, really? <laughs> Blimey, I, they were worried I was brain dead. I must have been worried I was brain dead. No, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, um, and then so they got Emma to uh, come in, um, and I was wheeled out onto the atrium of the fourth floor of the Whittington Hotel, uh, hotel Hospital. Sorry, I do stumble with my words, if only. Um, hospital, and it looks out over London. It's where, in mythology or otherwise, Dick Whittington stood. That's why it's called the Dick. It's what's called the Whittington Hospital. Yeah. So there I was, not looking out over London because I sh sh couldn't see anything. And Emma held my hand and played. Um, recordings of my children and our children, uh, my older ones and our children, talking to me and my brother, I think, um, and some music. And I don't remember any of this at all, nothing at all. And then when the doctors put me back in the lift, according to Hugh Montgomery, the, the prof who was in charge of, that, of the intensive care, um, I became lucid, I became coherent for the first time. And so that was a turning point in the, the end of May um, because I'd been in unconscious in intensive care for something like 40 days uh, up to that point. So they, they do find that's a sort of potential tipping point. If you're really in for a long time, they do get quite worried. But I was in that time because they were trying to get my lungs better. That's, that's an amazing love story. In, in itself, isn't it? That, that notion of somehow being reached in that way. 
you know, and it can only be love, can't it? That that and it's almost that sense of being drawn back out of the underworld. You know, that for me that that felt like you know a sort of indeed, and that was why I wrote. Um, I did think the more I heard about all this in retrospect, it did feel that um, that great piece of work that I always love, uh, the Odyssey. Uh, Odysseus manages to, he cheats a lot of things. He managed to listen to the sirens um, by tying himself to the uh, to the mast. Um, and then the other thing he manages to cheat is to go to the land of the dead, just to check it out. And um, I thought, well, in a way, I'm, I'm not actually Odysseus. I'll just clear that up for you, Chris. <laughs> um, cue drawing. Um, and um, I... I uh, I had to sort of saw myself as having visited the land of the dead. And then because I, I've lost most of the sight in this eye and most of the hearing from this ear, um, I sort of thought about this. And so I wrote, I'm a traveler who reached the land of the dead. I broke the rule that said I had to stay. I crossed back over the water. I dodged the guard dog. I came out. I've returned. I wander about. I left some things down there. It took bits of me as prisoner, an ear and an eye. They're waiting for me to come back. The ear is listening. The eye is the lookout. So that was one way, you know, I said earlier about putting words on a page, sorting things out. One way to do that is to be ruthlessly real. That's one of the things I do. And then right up the other extreme is to be ruthlessly mythological. Yes. In other words, to visit mythological things, Shakespeare plays, anything that I've read and sort of find a place in them. And this is why I think literature is so powerful and important in schools. And it's also kind of, it's incalculable. That's the point about literature. The idea of trying to tie it down into kind of measurable quantities and, you know, giving marks for getting it right, as if somehow or other, mm. all you've got to do is take eggs out of a box um, and you don't have to cook the eggs or change the eggs. It's just that is the egg that is in that box. That is what Shakespeare meant. So, boom, take it out, say it, get the mark for it. But I think there's something else going on with literature and the way I use it, and I mean that, is to find these incalculable things that reverberate in you in ways that you couldn't expect. I never thought as I've read the Odyssey, that somehow or other one day I would think I visited the land of the dead. That's that's not for me, that bit. You know, maybe my bits, you know, grappling with, um, I don't know, Scylla and Charybdis or something. You know. um, or following Arsenal Football Club. Yes, I, I, I hear you. Yeah. Exactly, that's right. You know, I haven't stabbed anybody's eye out, um, which Odysseus did, just to clear that up with people, <laughs> not me. Um, and so, in a way, these these myths these stories what they enable you to do is to sit in them and be contained by them so that the pain of the things that we go through as well as the joys they're somehow or other we're, we're in a secure place because it's not actually happening to us when we read it it's happening to that poor bloke Odysseus or it's happening to whoever uh, to Jane Eyre we were talking about earlier Dear reader I lived um, instead of dear reader I married him um, so yeah and that's nice to be able to sometimes, instead of being ruthlessly real, as I repeat myself, to be ruthlessly uh, mythological. Lovely, Michael. And, and, and that also comes across in, in your use of humour, the way that you can sort of just sort of go to this awful place and then start to sort of, you know, come out of it with, with insights in, into sort of how you're feeling. I, I love the, the um, passages where you talked about your, the sense of your body you know, the, the being sort of liminal, being on the edge of something and and then sort of coming back and thinking about every part of you uh, in a new way, which must be, I suppose, the journey of recovery uh, where you are, you're, you're taking an inventory, I suppose, of, of different things and different uh, faculties that might be failing or coming back. Yes. Um, I mean, when they told me that I had... Uh, blood clots, right? Immediately I thought, and I've written about this, is uh, blood clots, is that they're really like scabs. That they're, they're like, um, it's when the blood solidifies. And so the huge danger of having blood clots, which I had in my pulmonary blood vessels, 
uh, is that they'll wander off into either your brain or your heart and either give you a stroke if they're in your brain or in your heart, that your whole system will stop. And uh, so when I was told about it, I, I immediately sort of thought, because I did um, O-level biology and I also started doing medicine, I could sort of picture lungs and things like this. And so I remember saying, well, what's going to happen to these blood clots? And I remember the doctor saying, <laughs> you'll digest them. Oh. <laughs> and I, I've, and I've written about this. So, so, and I thought, digest them. And immediately I thought, and it is quite disgusting, so get ready to put your hands over your ears, folks, of how as kids, when we got scabs, we did used to pick them off and chew them. This is a sort of child's thing. And of course, I was going to say that's another thing that happens to you when you lie there all day is that your life goes zigzagging through to childhood, back to adulthood, to the deaths of others, to wondering about your own death and zip, zip, zigzagging and zipping between the two. And as you say, that what keeps recurring is this thing about your body. And though I haven't mentioned it, that in a part, in part, the inspiration behind this is, is King Lear. That what happens in King Lear is that here's this great grand king, you know, with his kingdom and his three daughters being very lordly and magnanimous about bestowing it on his three daughters. Uh, and then at the, the kind of nadir point of the play, he's just reduced to him and poor Tom, who isn't really poor Tom, as we know, he's Edgar. Uh, poor Tom's a cold, and there they are, just feeling the weather. They are exposed. Shakespeare has created this incredibly brilliant metaphor of a of a storm and out on the on the in on the heath on the kind of moorland. And I found myself thinking of that and thinking of how your body is you're as it were reduced to poor forked man you know you're reduced to being this kind of simple mortal thing in the hands of others and so that's kind of how I got reduced to that and also listening to other people the ward is dark I can hear a metal purr from the other side then a bubbling syrup he coughs more bubbling it must be coming up from his chest the metal purr must be sucking it up. A light is on behind the curtains over there. The nurse tells him to keep still. And so you have companions in this place. And every now and then you become aware of them, obviously, when out of the coma. And because sometimes they're behind curtains, there's a sort of strange kind of unearthly quality about it. And the, 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 the suctioning, as it's called, you can hear it. It goes like that. And then you hear this... And then sometimes the odd groan with it. You look up and you see this light behind a curtain. And you see you see what we're reduced to. And also the, the fact that you're totally in the hands of these, well, yes. as you've depicted them in, in your wonderful pictures, as kind of angels of mercy. Um, I mean, they're much more than that because they're, 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 they're dealing with your, all your nasties. They are, aren't they, Michael? And, and yet... In a, in, in a sense, as a layman, you know, I, I and, and I, I'm not, a, I can't be alone in this, uh, being utterly awestruck by the quiet, methodical professionalism of of carers, particularly, I suppose, in the ICU environment where it is a very sort of technological sort of environment, but just all the different things that need to be doing so, as commonplace as. And I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, uh, about the wonderful um, part of the the book, which is the the, the diaries, uh, the the daily entries from from the uh, the, the medical um, staff who looked after you. Um, but I love I love the, the the way that they mention everyday things, whether it's mm. cutting cutting uh, fingernails or shaving uh, shaving you. They, these this little inventory of of everyday. Um, acts of, of love i would say yes indeed let's let's read one this is the patient diary there we are i'll show that to the camera patient diary that they wrote so they were writing after their shifts so these are nurses and as you'll hear uh, not necessarily trained in intensive care if you think when you're trained in intensive care then one of the things you're trained in is that the person you're looking after with such devotion and care and as you say love may die 42% of my ward died when I was in there. And some people were coming in from all other parts of the hospital where people don't normally or necessarily die. 
And so all this devotion and care, and of course it was very, very difficult for them, young people who may not necessarily have seen that amount of mortality. So here's Holly writing to me on the 6th of May. And say writing to me, remember I'm just basically virtually looking like somebody in a morgue with tubes in and out of them, not responding a great deal, far from it. Afternoon, Michael, it's Holly, helper again. Today I'm looking after you with lovely nurse Joy. We've had a busy day so far. It started off with spa time, a bed bath, hair comb, nail cut and clean, and we also shaved your beard. Sorry, we know you usually have a beard. That's just so we can keep the area around your trachea, the place where the tube sits in your neck, clean. We've placed some pads on your eyes to keep them closed as they had been open and you need some rest. I tend to sleep with my eyes half open, by the way. We then spent some time listening to your fab playlist again. That was put together by Emma and uh, our children. You appear much more comfortable and settled today. You've been breathing with the ventilator today and your oxygen requirement has been reduced. All great progressions. We're going to let you rest now as we've moved you on to a new bed. I hope it's comfortable. I'm unsure whether I will work with you again, Michael, as the IT unit is slowly returning to normal. This means helpers, which it means her, We'll go back to our usual jobs. I should be heading, heading back to my bladder and bowel team. I wish you all the best with your recovery. You're a fighter and can do this. Best wishes, Holly. P.S. Happy birthday for tomorrow. I mean, it's just majestic, isn't it? It's wonderful. It's wonderful, Michael. It is that sense in this in this environment of, of, of sort of oxygen masks and beeping machines and, and the whole thing that the people caring for you are addressing you as a person, not this sort of inert figure being kept alive by technology. They, they are seeing you. And I think that's, uh, that's an extraordinary act of devotion. I, and, and for me, a, a real um, standout part of the book because I didn't see it in manuscript. So it was wonderful to discover that. Yeah, look, I'll show you the, the writing itself. You can see, you know, when it's typed, it doesn't quite have that immediacy. Afternoon, Michael. Oh, look, it's, it's actually it opened up Holly's letter. Look, can you see it? <laughs> yes. Can you see that? Wonderful. There's Holly's letter, um, the playlist, and going back to the bladder and bowel team. There you go. And P.S. Happy birthday for tomorrow. There we are. You mm. can see it on the bottom. Am I showing it right? You are. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there it is. I have this treasure. Look, here it is. Mm. Patient diary. This diary can be completed by relatives, friends, nurses, doctors, it says. Yeah. It and may passed help. on, uh, I, I would say, passed on, Michael, in the pages of this extraordinary book. Um, and you were sharing with me a, a slightly unfortunate review. Um, we don't need to necessarily mention the newspaper, but, um, but they, they sort of had an extraordinary view of that, didn't they? Yes, they, they seem to say that, that it was a mistake to put the, the letters in the book because they were so ordinary. <laughs> and then there was a dash, but perhaps that's the point. And I just thought, this is the humanity of ordinary people, not a writer who, in a sense, is quite self-conscious, like I have to admit, you know, I've said how self-conscious I am in writing, thinking about the Odyssey and King Lear, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that here are ordinary people whose job is not to write, whose job is to care, and yet, well, not and yet, it's not and yet at all, they express that care through their words. And I was a bit distressed, really, to see that someone was saying that the writing was ordinary. There's nothing ordinary about that piece that I read to you. I mean, the idea that this mm -hmm. is someone apologising for shaving me, explaining what a trackie is, because that's opening up this bit here, explaining to me, even though I'm inert, She's explaining it to me for, you know, maybe never, maybe it's for my relatives because I'm not going to live. Or if it is me that when I come round in six weeks time, get round to reading it. I mean, just behind that letter, there is so much. And even that I'm, I'm laughing, but the, you know, that she's in the bladder and bowel team. Well, I mean, that's so much about her life that here is somebody who's in the black and she's come over and dealing with us in this terribly extreme situation. And she goes home. And as we saw in the film that you've mentioned, Chris, you know, it got too much for them. They got yes, too much. Course. They yes. went home and sobbed because, mm. and without even necessarily knowing because they didn't have the time or the, the experience or whatever it is to be able to, as it were, offload it. 
the deaths had been, as it were, dumped on them. And they, they you know, I'm not saying Holly was like that, but, you know, it's All just... All I can say, Michael, is thank goodness uh, we don't have performance-related pay in the <laughs> NHS and we can keep that bill down, but, you know, a pay rise down to 1%. Um, I know I'm opening up a can of worms here, as so we're mm. going to get terribly political, I know. And we have a few minutes because I would love to open open this up to questions. But just before we do, just, just to touch on the political, because I think uh, both you and I are political animals in, in, in other sort of parts of our, our professional lives. Um, how do you feel about the notion of a uh, COVID uh, inquiry, you know, actually learning some lessons from this? You know, I've heard it said that it's too soon. I've heard it said that, you know, it's it's redundant because obviously it'll just be people exercising hindsight. Uh, how do you feel about uh, about that question? I think the nation has to have the possibility to know again how it unfolded, to know day by day what was being said, what was being done, and what wasn't being done. What did people know, and then also what actual intentions were and what covert intentions were going on. So it's my view, and all right, it is only one view, that the government and some leading scientists were playing around with this idea of herd immunity without vaccination. And we know this from their appearances on TV. Three top government scientists came on and said, we have to create herd immunity. And um, we know that uh, key figures in the government were playing around with this idea that um, we shouldn't really do anything. I mean, Boris Johnson used the phrase that he was against market segregation. I know it's a bit obscure, but what he meant was that there shouldn't be government intervention in this thing. So let's piece this all together, step by step, what they meant and did they understand fully that when they were going to bring in this herd immunity, which is bad biology anyway, that this would entail inevitably the deaths of thousands of people, those most likely to catch it, who we've heard over and over again, the over 70s and those with underlying health problems, were we superfluous to needs in the minds of those people? Because if we were, then this is a terribly dangerous situation to be in because this is people in high places thinking of sections of the population, not just one or two people, but tens of thousands of people as being unnecessary or too expensive to keep alive or a whole set of crude calculations like that. And if that's the case, we have to know. And we also have to know that what was this Operation Cygnus, I think, or Operation Signet, whatever its name was, Operation Cygnus, I think, uh, which took place in two or three years before the pandemic, which was a feasibility study. It was what would happen if a pandemic hit us. Yes. And why, if, they, if that took place and there were these recommendations, why weren't those recommendations put in place? I think Jeremy Hunt has raised that question. Well, this has to be drawn together so that we know, so if there is any other kind of pandemic, we have to know, did people really think in high places that people like me were superfluous to needs? So I feel it personally, I feel it socially, I feel it politically. So, yes, I think we need an inquiry and it must be done as forensically and as scientifically as possible. Um, you keep people like me away, if you like. I'll, I'll turn up and start ranting and saying, you know, I can't see with my eye and my toes are numb. That's not really going to help. But you have to look at, look at it in a documentary way and see what it, what it is that people actually said on that day as the infection as the virus took root if you think if you like and we have to say well look this is how we got to where we are and we can compare it with other countries let's let's look at south korea australia <coughs> excuse me new zealand thailand let's look at them and see well could we have done something like that perhaps not perhaps yes let's find out whether we could have done Yes, I, th I think so, Michael. I, I, I agree with so much of that. All, all I can hope for, in a sense, is that maybe some of the initial sort of thoughts about this were were sort of couched in in sort of lazy journalistic terms. Um, you know, far be it from me to cast aspersions, but but possibly we do have 
some leaders in, in, in our government with a journalistic background. And maybe they think in these sort of slightly sort of, you know, wide and, and sort of um, uh, supposedly clever debating points. Um, and that, that I think is possibly a worry. I was tremendously re reassured, I think, when the Downing Street briefings started to come up with charts and started to talk about possibilities from a scientific point of view. Up until then, it all felt like this was just, well, we should be fine as long as we've got a sort of, you know, good stiff upper lip and all just sort of get on with it, you know. Um, I think my problem is slightly different because it, there were some scientists talking about this thing, herd immunity, and it is actually rubbish biology because humans move about over the face of the earth. You know, we're not herds of cows uh, confined to one farm or just several farms or even on an island. Um, we move about the surface of the earth. And as we're seeing, if you let a virus rip, then it will mutate and you never know how strong or weak the resistance is. And actually, insofar as animal groups get immunity, <clears throat> one way they get it is because <clears throat> we pass on genes from one generation to another, or the genotype, as it's called, that is resistant to the disease. We we've seen this. I mean, if you see rabbits, I mean, we're old enough to remember the terror of rabbits on the, on the roadside <clears throat> with myxomatosis. And they were, as it were, developing herd immunity and there they were hopping along or we saw, you know, rows and rows of dead rabbits. And in the end, rabbits passed on some immunity generations. And of course, rabbits reproduce much, much more quickly than we do. So again, this idea that, oh, well, we'll get the herd immunity by the virus spreading through the population. And yet the biology of herd immunity involves passing on genes and we take a bit longer than rabbits to do that, I've noticed. I don't know if you've noticed that, Chris. <laughs> I, I certainly I, have, yes. Have you, you've passed on your genes? Uh, probably <laughs> not your Levi Strauss genes. That is. No, no, I um, have those as well. Yes. Of course. Um, and it does take a bit of time, you know. And so I just think these were scientists talking like that. Um, and no interviewer, I found myself thinking, no interviewer, didn't any of you do A-level biology where we heard about that sort of stuff? Anyway, there you go. I do mention this in the book too. It's sort of I, it's in my reveries as I was recovering. And I, I came across, you know, this immunity thing and I, I found myself appalled by it. And then also I read an article um, about bus drivers and I got really upset that there were bus drivers in their cabs, unprotected because nobody said protect. People got on buses, breathed on them because nobody said we shouldn't. And what do you know? A lot of bus drivers, out of proportion with the rest of the population, got ill and some died. Um, and indeed, in the film that we've mentioned, um, one of my co-occupiers uh, of the intensive care ward was, a, is, was and is a bus driver. Uh, and he's recovered too. Um, and so, uh, yes, I just, and I've written about this, that it was just so upsetting to sort of realise that people were treated as expendable, you know, bus drivers who take us from place to place, you know, felt terrible about it. Anyway, I think Chris has possibly had to leave us. I don't know whether there's an emergency there. So maybe I'll, oh no, he is there. I am here. I, oh I've good, now... very good. No, I thought I've... maybe I heard a bang and then I, I saw a blank piece of paper and a blank piece of paper means to me, uh, write on it and to you means something different. It, it does. Now, you... what I, I would like to do, I think for the, for the next few minutes is just, um, uh, look at some um, questions, some some of the questions coming in. Um, and I would like to sort of do some drawings as as we go. Um, now I'm just. Uh, I can't see the questions. So are you going to ask? I, me the questions? I'm going to ask you. I'm going Good. to ask Lovely. you. And I, I have some coming up now. Good. Um, now there's. I, I want to start with one from Jean Brandwood, um, and she asks, "Do you know if the nurses wrote diaries for all the patients? I think it's an amazing thing for them to have done, and perhaps also a way of them to deal with the daily horrors of what they're dealing with." Absolutely. Um, yes, they do. And I've spoken to intensive care nurses about how wonderful this uh, diary was for me, and it's part of their training. So as I've said, on the front, uh, there's this note from the hospital, and it says the diary may help with the patient's post critical care recovery by providing them with information and insight into a time when they were not aware. 
So as many of the patients in intensive care as possible are given these diaries um, to, to enable us to do precisely that because, I mean, I've, I've slightly missed it out from the talk is, is from what we've been saying is that Emma tried to explain to me what had happened. And at first I couldn't understand her. And when I understood it, I couldn't remember it because one of the things that happened was I lost memory and I lost some medium term memory, but also I'd lose the memory of something that happened a bit earlier. So it was analogous to dementia, re dementia really. Um, and so to be able to read this di read these diaries, read these diary entries, um, was a way for me to understand what had happened because I mean, at one point Emma said, you, you were in intensive care for 48 days. And at that point I thought she meant being cared for intensively. I didn't understand that I was in a coma. And then when she said I'd been in a coma, I thought, when? And then she explained to me, well, for April and most of May. And I remember just staring into the distance thinking, really? And I mean, so April and May had just gone and I didn't figure it out where it had gone to. Um, and so this diary, and I think, uh, in fact, the bus driver in the film that we keep mentioning, he mm. says that, he says precisely that. Um, Raymond, I think his name is. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's vital and they do. It, it wasn't a special treat just because uh, Michael Rosen was there and they thought, um, well, as he did Bear Hunt, we'll write him a diary. Um, no. <laughs> That's one very kind to of them to mention <laughs> bear hunt, but yes, it's it's for uh, all of us. It, it, I, I was possible. I was very struck actually by by that sort of the the, the, <clears> the personal and and I I think in a very real sense poetic nature of of writing uh, messages to to patients. I've just been sketching, you know, that that we've become so used to the uh, the current sort of view, I think, of, of uh, doctors, nurses in this extraordinary array of equipment that sort of sets them back from us in some ways. And yet that is an example, the diary entries, the, the writing is an example of how you can still be close to someone even when you have to for your own protection and theirs, uh, protect yourself with, with uh, PPE, a term we're now very aware of. There's another question here from Ruth Blue. Um, what sort of dreams did you have? And if you remember any when you were in, do you remember any when you were in the induced coma? I've been very lucky. Some people who come out of the induced comas bring with them nightmares, hallucinations, delirium, paranoia. And I've come out of it with uh, two main dreams that I had over and over again. Uh, one of them is why the book is in part, why it's called Many Different Kinds of Love, which I had a very strange, weird, utopian dream where a man appears and he's German and he's in a bib and brace suit with a 1950s tractor and his family beside him. And he's in a part of Germany where, where I know this sounds sort of political and absurd, but where neo-Nazis are organising and he gives me a little lecture almost. And he says to me in English, but with a German accent, he says that we won't survive. We won't, we can't live with this kind of hate around. We need many different kinds of love, love for our lovers, love for our fathers and mothers, for our children, um, for people out there. And even for people we don't know, he says, we need many different kinds of love or we'll be destroyed. And I kept having this dream and it even got to a point where I got distressed that I was having the dream because what would happen would be the tractor would arrive, he would stand next to it and I'd think, oh no, this dream. And then I got distressed that he, he, he was referring to a manifesto and I would say, I've got it somewhere in the house. And I remember talking to Emma in my dream saying, Emma, what did, have I, do you know, what did I do with that? What did I, where did I put it down? So that was one dream. And then the other dream I had was of a German Christmas party. I don't know why these German things are cropping up. My, my background is not German. My, my great grandparents and so on were, were Polish. Um, and we're at a German Christmas party, which I've never been to. And we're sitting around outside in the garden. It's night and I've got a rug around my legs and I'm not admitting that I can't move. And we're, we're on a bench and people are singing and someone comes up to me and says, 
what we do at Christmas is we have these little purple berries and they're called Vassbieren. There's no such thing, by the way. They said they're called Vassbieren and we throw them up in the air and they burst. And when they burst, we all sing. And so that's, he then did, they did that, all the people and the children, and they were singing. Um, and there's some lovely songs, little German songs. I'll find them, bow mein cuckoo, that sort of thing. Oh, wie wohl ist mir am Abend, these sorts of things. And they were singing these, and then they threw these Vassbieren up in the air, and pow, they exploded. And I remember thinking how beautiful and how lovely. And then, you see, the distressing thing was the dream would come again, and I'd know what it was, and I would try to stop the dream, and I couldn't. So I've put these in the book, these two dreams, because I, I wanted to sort of put the sadness to bed, literally to bed, so that I'm not so saddened by it. Um, so yes, those were two dreams I had, and, and I had another one, another distressing one, that Emma and I were at Land's End, and there was a wall, and it was the big cliff that goes sort of straight down to the sea. And I think I was stuck on the wrong side of the cliff, or she was one way or another, and I'm stuck in the wall. So these things, of course, as, as often, they, they become quite symbolic, don't they? And I either can't get through the wall and Emma's trying to pull me through or I'll fall down the cliff. Um, so there was another dream that I had as I was recovering. Absolutely Thank fascinating. you for that. There's another lovely question here um, from Polly Stanton, who asks, you mentioned mythology, but did any words or stories from your Jewish background provide a way of explaining your experience? Uh, very often what happened were conversations with my parents and my father in particular um, he spoke, he, he spoke English, but he, he would often sort of fill his conversation with bits of, of Yiddish. So Yiddish is the language that Eastern European Jews spoke and still do and it's in New York and it's in Mel Brooks's films and we've all got words that we know and and I probably know about between 100 and 200 words and phrases but my dad but probably much much more and he would just let them out and some of these are, are in the book so my dad um when he got ill seriously ill in the last two years of his life I thought that in a way he it, it was very sad and I've, I've written about this as well that he he sort of shrunk from being someone whose landscape looked out on the world. He looked out on the world and nothing was missed. You know, he would just draw on things from Russian literature, German, Italian, French. You know, he would talk about, you know, Shakespeare or Dickens or Thomas Hardy, all this sort of stuff. And he could sort of look out on the world. And that when he got ill, um, he, he kind of shrunk into his illness. And uh, he would say, mustn't kvetch, mustn't kvetch. Now, kvetch is a nice word to mean mustn't complain. But quite often when people say I mustn't kvetch, what they're doing is kvetching. And so I started thinking of my dad as becoming Mr. Kvetch, like a new Mr. Man, or in fact, a Mr. Mensch. Um, Mr. Mensch books. You know, Mensch means a good person. In German, it means just uh, people. But in Yiddish, it means a, a good person. So my dad would go, Mensch, Mensch, and that would mean a good person. Or Zaya Mensch, he'd say, that would mean be a good person and go and go to the shops for me. Zaya Mensch, you'd say, Zaya Mensch. And uh, he, 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 I started to think that maybe my dad had become Mr. Kvetch. And I think I've, I've yes, I know, I've, I've written a poem about that, is the idea that I must try not to be Mr. Kvetch. So I, I chide myself in the book several times. I chide myself not to pretend to be a doctor because I did try once to be a doctor and decided I, I couldn't. And um, so another thing I chide myself for is not to be Mr. Kvetch. Uh, and so um, it's not exactly uh, Jewish mythology. It's more like kind of Jewish popular culture. Um, and yes, I, I did draw on that. Um, and also now in the present tense, I talk about, well, in fact, uh, I'll just read this one quickly. Two physios come over. They ask me to walk across the room. They say, that's very good. They ask me to push my legs against their hands. They say, that's very good. One of them asks me, what are my long-term objectives? I stop and think, what are my long-term objectives? Do I have long-term objectives? Should I have long-term objectives? I would like to write a book about a French dog called Gaston Le Dog. I don't say that. I say that I would like to be able to walk to the Jewish deli on the corner and wheel the shopping back in our trolley. 
The physio smiles. She writes it down in her book. I'm trying to say that going shopping and bringing it back seems huge, much bigger than anything I can do now. It feels like a long-term objective. Anything else, she says? Live for a bit more, I think. And I've never bothered to pickle cucumbers. I just buy them. But my mother made lovely pickled cucumbers. I would like to try that one day. You're doing very well, they say. So again, not quite Jewish mythology, but uh, more like Jewish popular culture. My mother's pickled cucumbers were really very, very good. And her mother, my bubba, that's grandmother, uh, my mother, I remember one time we went over there and my mum said, I want to make pickled cucumbers just like you did. And she said, how to do it. And then she said, well, how do I know how much salt to put in? And Bubba said, to taste, just, just to taste. And she kept saying, to taste. And I've got this memory of my mum going home and trying to taste the, the brine that you put the cucumbers in and going, to taste, to taste. So making pickled cucumbers is sort of, <laughs> I haven't done it yet. Um, someone gave me some, Rachel gave us some very nice pickled cucumbers. Thank you, Rachel, if you're watching. I'm, I'm a man of, of, of Spartan um, discipline and and very few sort of cravings but uh, I have to admit uh, Michael every so often I do have a particular craving and that is for pickled cucumbers mm. so I've been delighted by the, 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 the that, that sort of renaissance of the Polish shop that, that, that happened a few years ago where you just could go and buy wonderful pickled cucumbers and still can yes look still out can. for the look yes. out for the label Krakus uh, K R a K U S. Let me recommend a crack. Oh yes, pickle yes, cube. I know them well. Um, Good. Now another question um, here, which I think is rather lovely. Um, this is from Akum, uh, who asks, "What music did your wife and children select for you?" Uh, right. Um, they selected things that uh, I couldn't hear. That's because <laughs> I was still in a coma. So they did produce a lovely playlist, which I've heard since. And there's every possibility that it actually helped to wake me up, but I have no memory of it. I've heard it a couple of times and it had some of my favorites, um, talking heads, um, uh, same as it ever was, same as it ever was. Mm. You, you know, the one, what's it, what's it, what's it? I forgot, always forget what it's actually called. Someone will put that up on the chat room, but it's where he says, where David Byrne goes, same as it ever was, same as it ever was water running over anyway um yeah uh you've got a beautiful wife and a beautiful home that one i think they, yes they, I, yes i know it and i'm struggling to remember the title yeah the title yes uh life life oh life's in the title i think they gave me some otis redding they know that i love that um some otis redding um i think they gave me that redoing of um the 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 song uh, it's a mad world which was uh, done at a kind of top tempo back a long time ago and then more recently mm. there was a beautiful slow version and Emma plays it on the piano that was on the soundtrack wasn't it of Donnie Darko I think that's right um, which it's my mad goodness world yes that what a one. wonderful sort of anthem in a sense you know mm. I, I think we can all endorse that um, and, and Emma Emma plays it on the piano she she hasn't for a bit because she's studying but. Uh, I absolutely adore that. And I think I think that was on there as well. Mm. And also, I think you mentioned in the book, uh, Django Reinhardt, which... That's uh, right. Yes, of wonderful. course. I love that sort of notion mm. of sort of wonderful jazz styling, syncopated jazz styling, sort of um, while you're in this other, in this liminal state. Uh, yes. Oh, if anybody, you know, wants to just be revived, then just go to YouTube and find some Django Reinhardt. It is just quite incredible music. Good for um, physiotherapy, I would imagine. Mm, and and also um, a different route of jazz. So it's just wonderful. It's, 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 it's a kind of another branch of the jazz world. I think... Um, the, Michael, we've got time for one more question. Oh, right. I, I must shut I, up. Yes. I think it's a rather important one. And it comes from Catherine uh, Bonus. And she asks, you spend lots of time in schools with young people. What, if anything, will you tell children about the COVID year? Hmm, that's challenging. Um, I've had challenging questions in schools. Uh, somebody said, uh, you look like Michael Rosen. And um, that was quite challenging. There was another <laughs> one where I said, down behind the dustbin, I met a dog called Jim. He didn't know me and I didn't know him. And this boy shouted out, well, how did you know his name was Jim then? And that, that, that was a challenging one. 
And I remember saying, are there any more questions? And somebody said, yeah, who won the FA Cup in 1971? Um, so you get, I could answer that one, by the way. Um, and um, yeah, so what am I going to say? I mean, one of the most challenging questions I, I ever had was I'd just done my bit and somebody said, oh, what happened to Eddie in your poems? And I had to say he died because I'd written about Eddie when he was a toddler mm. and they wanted, you know, were there any more funny stories? And I had to say he died. And that, in actual fact, was the spur for me to then write a book about what did I feel about Eddie dying, you see? Yes. And four children, the sad book. Um, and so what will I tell children? Well, some of them, I've already doing virtual uh, appearances in schools via Zoom and so on. And um, I say to them, I've, I've been ill. I tell them what's what's happened that I can't really see with this eye and I can't really hear with this ear. Um, and children are very matter of fact, aren't they? I mean, I remember when they asked me that question about Eddie, there was a sort of pause and I said it. And then the next question was sort of, where did you live when you were a child? It was just something yes. that, that yeah. wasn't related. And so when I say I was ill, they go, oh, right. Oh, so that's a, that was an ill person, was it? And so there's a lovely matter of factness, a, a way in which we make these things into huge peaks and troughs and there's somehow or other that maybe it's just when it's me in front I don't know but there's somehow or other it sort of seems to be without the peaks and troughs so um yeah it's happened already um I've, I've started talking about it and finding ways of saying it and well I mean as a book I mean it's I don't think there's anything in there that I don't think somebody aged let's say eight or nine plus uh, couldn't read for themselves. Uh, oh, I agree. Yes, it wasn't intended for children. As mm. I say at the very beginning, it was just me trying to sort things out. But any eight to ten year old, fifteen, twenty year old coming across it, then uh, I don't think they'll be damaged by it. <laughs> I, you're, I'm sure you're right. What a lovely note to to end on, Michael. I, I think this book is is an incredibly special book. It is a book because, in a sense, it is your experience, um, and it is special because in a sense it's ordinary as well it it, it contains your experiences um it it contains many different uh, different kinds of love um and i well i've been privileged to be part of it so uh, i'd like to thank you michael and thank you for joining us uh, this this evening and uh, it's it's been wonderful to to chat i would uh, I would love to uh, to chat more together, maybe um, at a, a, a sort of cafe table with an extremely large uh, jar of pickled cucumbers. I love the idea. I will take you up on that. We will we will be there with the Krakus <laughs> wonderful <laughs> pickled cucumbers. Uh, yes, uh, very and good. some Django Reinhardt in the background. Uh, it's a date. <laughs> We've got it. And thanks to the British Library for having us. And thank you all for attending. And thank you, Chris, for asking such lovely questions and talking so beautifully. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And a massive thanks to Michael Rosen and Chris Riddell. Do keep an eye on the What's On pages on our website to see other amazing events we have planned for you. Please remember to fill out the feedback form. Thank you very much for joining us.